thank you to all of you for coming, and thank you to both of you. It has been really a delight to immerse myself in your work for the past few weeks. Um, I'd like to start with the question of musicality and the orality of the language you use. As you probably have already gotten from Emily's wonderful introduction, these are two writers who blur the lines between poetry and prose wonderfully and by intention. And in doing so, there's a quality to it that even when you're just reading it on the page, you can hear it being spoken as well. And from having talked to both of you and having listened to some of your interviews, I know that this is by design. So Vanessa, I wondered if I could start with you, if I could ask you, how does that musicality, that orality play itself into your work? And is that something you do in the drafting process or is that more of a revision situation? Um, so it's definitely something that's integral to the prose as written, like from the first draft, from the first words I write, there's definitely uh, the musical or should I say poetic element of the prose is, I suppose, at the forefront of my mind. The rhythmic element, the rhythmic qualities of the sentences are kind of, I, I sometimes say I write with my ear because I read everything out loud. Um, and my um, sense of the grammar of the sentence, the rhythm that I want to give the sentence is more intuitive than anything that I've um, learned, uh, shall I say, learned in school at least, in terms of the traditional structure of a sentence in English. So I really need to hear it to understand if the prose is going the way I want it to go, if it's being imbued with the rhythm I want it to have. I think that, I mean, music generally is w was probably my first kind of art. I loved, uh, when I was younger, I loved to play music, to write music. So what I perhaps realized quite late is that I probably put a lot of my kind of unrealized <laughs> musical dreams into writing. I probably put a lot of that into writing. So the typographical nature of music as it's visualized, as it's visualized in a score, say, definitely goes into the writing as it's organized on the page. Um, I think that, I think that unconsciously also, that th and again, I've had now a few years to reflect on this, if you'd asked me two years ago or while I was writing it, I, w I would have just said, I don't know, I'm, I just do it. But now I've had some time to reflect on it. I think unconsciously I had wanted to give um, the words some of the resonance of a spoken word, you know, this sense that I think music does this very well where you have nothing, uh, say if that piano were being played, you have nothing and then there's something. You have silence and then there's something. And I think in kind of incorporating big silences in the text, I think I was trying to imbue the text with some of that, some of that kind of uh, emptiness that um, you get when you have uh, when you are listening to music, you listen to the silence. And thematically that fits in really well as with this collection, right? The, the burst of action, the spark within a silent place, within a dark place, that's really fascinating. Um, Dimitris, how about you? Um, if I can uh, return the question back to you, why did you think there is uh, orality in my work? Because when I was reading it, especially at the beginning, because I read it on a screen, which is not my favorite way to read a book, I started reading it out loud to get into the minds of the characters. And in doing so, it enabled me to find my place within the narrative, within the characters, in a way that it hadn't when I first started just by reading on the page. And then I was able to kind of hear my own voice even as I was reading silently. And that's why I started to think, there must be something here. And also, these are characters in your trilogy that are speaking to us, right? Yeah, I in think many it's, ways. it's, I mean, we're talking about an orality which is uh, based on, on the written word. And uh, now we just uh, start mixing things again, like, uh, for instance, the, the title of this uh, conversation. 
uh, which is uh, hybrid uh, uh, journeys in sound and sight, and you've got the hybrid in parentheses. And, uh, you know, starting from the beginning, I have to tell you that I, I have to confess, I did not like the title very much of this event in the very beginning, and the reason was, well, I mean, okay, perhaps it didn't exactly conform to uh, my initial plan, and my initial plan was uh, this European book tour to promote the prequel of the trilogy. So basically, you know, what we're doing in, in every event is, uh, you know, read a chapter from the new book, and then, you know, in this particular case, I would uh, speak about uh, uh, Kabbalism and the Orphic element in chapter O of the book. And then um, I saw this title, which contained the, you know, the hybrid element, uh, the sound element, and the sight element. And I was scratching my head in the beginning, not liking it. Uh, eventually, I, I started to like it. I started to like it. I, you know, I, I, I in, in the beginning, I, I thought, why do you have these brackets, uh, you know, around the word hybrid? Why did they put them? I mean, I don't know. Emily did it. I mean, I don't know who did it here, but somebody certainly did it. Who, who was did probably, it? Who was <laughs> Who did it? <laughs> now it's an investigation. Who was, uh, who, who was Find the brackets. Who was probably Please uncertain, you. Uh, you know, about whether to just, uh, you know, put it there or um, omit it altogether. Uh, so I started to think, uh, to think about the question of hybridity and in a way, your question about orality relates to the question of hybridity because we're talking about uh, a written text that has some oral properties. So again, you're talking about a hybrid. But if we go back, and if you think about the fact that nowadays there must be a huge trend to make everything hybrid as if that was a very new thing, in fact, uh, uh, yesterday evening, I was uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Marilena Simitis, who's um, a professor of political science at the University of Piraeus, and she was telling me that now we're talking about uh, even hybrid political regimes. So some of the political regimes are not considered exactly democratic, well, phenomenally democratic, but not really democratic. So um, the, the word hybrid has also entered political theory in that way. And of course, examples of those, uh, you know, governments are given. Hungary is mentioned as a country that uh, belongs to uh, that, say, category that would, you know, fit the, that definition. And of course, uh, um, she was telling me that also Noam Chomsky thinks that the USA uh, fit that definition. I don't know about that. However, um, to discuss hybridity is interesting, but uh, to me, uh, one has to point out the fact that we're not talking about anything new. Uh, we are uh, talking about something which was there. And um, again, Continuing to think about the title of the event that I, I initially did not like very much, and being in Louvre today uh, in, um, in the Sumerian exhibits, you see something, I mean, it's, it's interesting, because uh, what you've got, you've got the Sumerian sculptures, and you've got the window, and outside the window, you've got the classicist French sculptures. And it's, it's beautiful to compare. And one, there's one thing, there's one big difference uh, between, among, of course, the, the numerous differences between uh, sculptures of, uh, you know, 2500 BC and uh, sculptures of the, you know, uh, 1700, uh, uh, very close to our times. But uh, one thing that strikes you is that on the Sumerian sculptures, you've got scripture. They're written. You've got cuneiform, which is written all over. So there is a hybrid for you. This is a sculpture. It is a work of art. It is uh, a three-dimensional pictorial representation of, say, a human being. And still what you have is you've got, you can see it, 
uh, as uh, a textual environment. Imagine how strange that would be uh, if you had, um, you know, um, a classicist white marble sculpture written all over. So uh, we we have had hybridity from that time, from the very beginning of writing in the world, and of course. Um, now I just mentioned the combination of um, writing and um, and a sculpture, but again, in in the mythological representations of the time, this is what you still have. You have, um, uh, well, you have those uh, uh, again uh, um, beings, which are um, uh, a bull with uh, a human head. Right, and a winged bull, for that matter. So you've got three things, not 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 just two things, because hybridity is supposed to mean the combination of two things. If we stay close to the biological biological definition of it, so uh, it it is in the beginning of art. Uh, it is in the, it is there from the very start. Uh, and and uh, of course, you know, it, it develops in different ways. Now we have come to a point in which uh, we are uh, completely dominated by the written word and we're seeking elements of orality. We're just excavating the texts in order to find orality. But we should realize that even if we do, this is not the primary orality of the people that were initially oral. This is a secondary orality that is, uh, that is found in our texts, and we should, be, we, we should be very aware of that. I mean, uh, you are thinking of um, orality in the context of my work, but this is mostly a metaphor, because you're reading it on your own, and you're sil silent, and you are thinking about it in your head. Orality means what we're doing now. That's not there. No, I agree. I, I understand what you're saying. And of course, I'm sure many of you also know that hybridity, especially in literature it, and in art in general, is not a new thing by any stretch. It's the quality of it that I think has changed a lot. As you noted, now we're seeking hybridity in every realm, right? Even when it comes to professional career, the idea of being specialized in one career path, right? In one field, no longer, right? And if you try to do that, barring some very specific fields, you're not going to get very far. And I think that, and I'm glad you brought up the idea of, you know, a bull being combined with something else. I think when I think especially of ancient literature, hybridity was something monstrous, right? It was supposed to be, it's a disruption. It's not natural. And now we're coming into a place where hybridity is being celebrated, which comes with its own pitfalls, right? Which is not necessarily an entirely wholly positive thing. And it's interesting that you say that your work has no orality because yeah, you're very <laughs> right. It was monstrous in the in the um, in the ancient times. It well, I mean, uh, it was it was monstrous in ancient Greece. Uh, it wasn't exactly monstrous among the Sumerians that I I mean these these being that I made reference to, they're supposed to be protecting the ruler, so they are not monstrous. It's getting to it's getting to monstrosity, and it's becoming monstrous with the ancient Greeks. And there is a particular uh, being uh, one monster in the in ancient Greek, which is the chimera. Now, the chimera is a being that has uh, the head of a lion, uh, the body of a goat. And sometimes you've got a, a, a head of a goat that is protruding as well, so there are two heads. And then there is a tail that ends in a snake's mouth. And this is, this is a monster. The interesting thing is that the way um, uh, the, the concept of hybridity uh, was taken up by biology, also the concept of chimera is taken up by biology. And you've got chimeric creatures in biology. Chimera, etymologically speaking, comes from a Greek word which, which is himaros, with an eye, which means a goat, because of the goat element that I described earlier. So biology has taken that up. 
And uh, in contrast with um, hybrid, a hybrid being, which is, uh, um, say, uh, the uh, genetic material from two organisms into one, strictly that, like a mule, for instance, or a donkey, which is a zebra and a donkey, but you've got two things. Uh, in, um, uh, uh, as far, I I in, say, chimeric beings, biologically speaking, you've got more than uh, two chunks of material, of genetic material coming in. So you may have, you know, four um, as far as uh, genetic vari variation is concerned. And, uh, you know, if I want to go to my work, I would prefer actually the adjective chimeric for my work because there is a combination of more than, um, you know, two kinds of elements coming in. Especially, especially if you think of the variety uh, uh, in the trilogy and the new book. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, um, well, I'm making it a long story because it's very difficult for me to say, to pinpoint and, and say, okay, now, okay, so yes, this is, this, is, this is like that in my book because you've got three books in the trilogy very different, the one from the other, and you've got the new book which is very different from everything else, completely different techniques. Uh, you know, sometimes you've got orality, sometimes you, ha you don't have orality. It's very, very difficult for me to say and say, yes, I have this. It's 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 impossible. Next to impossible, perhaps. Chimeric, duly noted. Thank you. Um, but I do want to go back to that idea because um, I was going to I was going to bring up the fact that in your se in the second book in the trilogy there is a chorus, right? So there is an, a part of orality. There's a performance that happens in the second book. And Vanessa, I wanted to come back to you as well because to you were talking about from the very beginning as you're working on a piece. There's that sense of rhythm. You bring in the idea of literally music in, and just in terms of notation even on the page. But when you're writing dialogue, and Demetrius, this applies a little bit less to you because it's not so much you know, in quotations dialogue, how does that differ for you, Vanessa? How do you kind of distinguish between the musicality, the rhythm of the prose at large versus that of people actually speaking to each other? Um, I don't know if I um, take great pains to dis distinguish. I mean, just being a person in the world, you like listen to people speak and you try and, I mean, I don't try and imitate it actually. I don't really um, intend for any dialogue to sound natural or to imitate the speech I might hear in, uh, hear in the, or the real world or you know the way I might speak to somebody. There is a kind of natural, rhythm to a person's speech that I do find interesting. You know, the way listening to Dimitri speak, listening to you speak, you have different cadences, different emphasis in your speech and you just pick up on it. And sometimes you emphasize it or you do what you like with it um, in a way that pleases me, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, so there isn't much of a, there isn't much of a difference. I mean, to the to speak to the chimeric element, I suppose. Um, like I, I feel like it, <laughs> less like chimera. I suppose I would speak to my work like uh, layering, chimera almost. I don't know, especially in the animal kingdom, they're usually sterile, aren't they? I don't know if I'd want my. Um, to describe my work <laughs> like that, the a mule is sterile, the right? The hybrids are, the hybrids are sterile. A mule is sterile. A mule, a mule is sterile. The zonkey, the, the uh, chimeric animals, like I mean, there are, uh, for instance, some kinds of sponge. Uh, there, are, uh, there are humans. Yeah. That are uh, uh, because uh, uh, you may encounter uh, different genetic material in, uh, say, a kidney and uh, a liver. And uh, we don't even know who among us may be chimeric. Mm. I mean, there, there are elements. I mean, it, 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 you have to make a test to find that out, of <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but, we're certainly, but we're certainly, but we're certainly, but we're certainly hybrids. Sign me up. Uh, uh, in, uh, 
but we're certainly there is a of course uh, a, a hybrid element, and this is you know uh, I, it's 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 really very well known. Everybody knows that because we have uh, genetic material from the Neanderthals. Uh, each one of us, one to four percent. Each one of us uh, who uh, comes from north of sub-Saharan Africa. So the genetic material that we have north of sub-Saharan Africa uh, is uh, combining the Neanderthal element. So we are hybrids anyway, you know. We have been um, having intercourse with them uh, 40,000 years ago. Uh, it's there, not, not, not <laughs> the people, you know, south of sub-Saharan Africa, so, you know, there's some purity there perhaps, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, if you, if you take the, the concept, you can, uh, you can expand as much as you like. Any questions about zonkeys? No? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm really glad you brought up the idea of layers. Um, because I was thinking about it in terms of your writing processes. I know we've discussed this a little bit, but both of you have gone through very iterative processes. I remember you saying, Vanessa, that um, at another talk here at the American Library that you start a short story, it's almost a skeleton, right? And you layer upon layer the flesh of it. And as was mentioned during the introduction, Demetrius, your trilogy took 30 years to write, but it was published in the meantime, you changed it, and obviously yours has gone through literal translation and that it's been translated into so many languages. And so I wondered if one, uh, I would love to hear from both of you, if you could talk a little bit about that layering process, right, when it comes to not just the literal translation to other languages, but translating your vision onto the page and translating and then retranslating that vision to fit what you really want it to be. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, calling it a skeleton is like sort of maybe inaccurate. It's just the best way to describe, the best way to explain, I guess, how I write. But a lot of it go happens in my head, a lot of this kind of... So the, I suppose, uh, to use a genetic term to riff on the um, Neanderthal genes, recombination, I suppose, is the genetic, genetic process which s resorts and mixes up the genes in our genome. And I suppose if I that stage of the writing process is what goes on in my mind. So I'll have a sentence in my mind, and it'll probably stew there for six months, a year, and then things will be added to it, and then I'll say, um, and then it will s sort of just sort itself out. And then when it's at the stage where I can't, um, hold it in my mind anymore, then I'll start writing things down. Um, and I t just tend to write, w the layering is more, I suppose, in a way a defect in, well, perhaps not a defect, it's just the way I write, I write short. I always, I put down a story, I put down the first draft, and there are usually elements that I feel are missing or not there, elements of the text that I feel need filling out. So then, yes, I go and start from the beginning again and look and um, see where it needs work. But then again, you I could jump around. Um, sometimes if I think the beginning's fine, I'll work on the middle, the ending. And then I've gone back and rewritten the whole beginnings because uh, something at the end has changed. Um, and suddenly that unlocks something else. So there's no real rhyme or reason to it, I suppose. With hindsight, I tend to project logic onto the way it works, but it doesn't really work like that, you know. Again, it's like evolution, like the blind watchmaker is blind, completely blind, if I'm honest. <laughs> Demetrius? Well, there are different kinds of layering because there are different kinds of books. Uh, so, uh, when I uh, wrote the third book of the trilogy, wh which was the one to, to be written first, you had a layering that was there uh, on the semantic level. So uh, you had one text, but uh, because of um, the way uh, it was arranged both uh, syntactically, but also because of the words that um, uh, 
uh, came from uh, the entire span of uh, the Greek language, from Homeric Greek to modern Greek. Uh, there was, and there still is, of course, a kind of um, kaleidospo kaleidoscopic effect. Uh, so you can decide upon different meanings uh, of a word, and that will give you a different semantic result. And this is one layer. But this pertains to the actual book, The First Death. This is about that, which uses this particular technique. Now, on top of that, uh, in that particular book, there was an addition, a late addition, which was, I mean, if you think of that, the book was written back in 1996, and this addition that I'm talking about uh, was uh, performed, if, I, if I'm allowed to use the term, um, one and a half year ago. It, there's just a big um, distance uh, that led to the completion of this book. So after you finished reading with the text, you have a translator's note, but this is a fictional translator, which makes you understand that the whole book that you've read until then is a translation. So you see the layering. Now, in just to give you another example, I'll move from book three to book one, Z13 exit. There you have a different kind of layering. There you have a layering which is akin to the palimpsest, right? We have a palimpsest like we did in the Middle Ages. So a palimpsest is um, a, a, a book, a, a, a piece of uh, um, vellum uh, that has been scraped off or washed off and rewritten. And because of the materials that uh, were being used, obviously you can um, decipher the, 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 the layers underneath the text that is officially there for you. And sometimes you have two or three layers and uh, I remember there is um, um, I'm not exactly sure now, but there is uh, a Russian or a, a, a text from Ukraine that has an immense amount of layers, more than 30, that can be deciphered. Now, in Z213 exit, you have this kind of layering. Because it's supposed to be a booklet uh, that has been used by someone as his diary, and then he ha it has been taken up by someone else, and it is used as again as a diary, but by a second narrator. You see there are two different, in fact, there are two different layers also as far as uh, the color of fonts are concerned. There are gray fonts and there are black fonts. And or on top of that, or beneath that, in the circumstances, you've got excerpts that are mostly from the Old Testament. So again, this is the third layer. And um, the full text of Z213 Exit is a combination and a dialogue between those three elements, to put it rather roughly. I mean, there is th the situation is a little more intricate than that, but, but that's, you know, that's that's a basic way to see it. So you've got, as you see, um, now we have talked about two completely different ki kinds of layers because the one is, like I said, semantic, and this one is is actually as if you were confronted with uh, a medieval manuscript, which is completely which is completely a completely different experience from a print text, since we're talking about writing and since we're talking about orality. I mean, I had the chance to, I was uh, about a year ago, I was in the, um, in the Sinai Desert uh, in, uh, in St. Catherine's Monastery. You've got one of the, one of the two oldest uh, Bibles are there. And um, I asked the director of the library to show me uh, uh, a manuscript uh, of, of the kind, and it's, it's extremely interesting because of the many layers of the text 
Uh, but the palimpsestist is also an extremely difficult thing to approach. It doesn't have this friendly face to you, like a print book has. Um, but on the other hand, it allows uh, a much greater amount of freedom in you handling it. I mean, you're not, uh, you're, you're not forced to follow the implied rules of a justified text, like we do, I mean, in, 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 in our books nowadays. So, in a way, okay, now that's stretching it, but in a way you can call it a kind of ergodic literature. Of course, when we're talking about ergodic literature nowadays, we, we, we mean works that are contemporary. But it's ergodic because you need to just work to approach it. But different, different layers, though. Do I have time to ask one more question for the Q&A? I wanted to ask both of you, so we've talked a lot about sound. Um, I hate to bring up the title again, Dimitris, but it's, it's sight and sound. We just got through bracket gate. I don't know if we're gonna make it through this one, but I did, but both of you describe the experience of being a human body, and I use that deliberately. Um, in many places in your text, in your texts, I should say, you discuss there's a person, there's a character, and then the way they, they describe body parts will be almost completely distant from them. But these are also characters who are going through immense pain often, right? Physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain. And so it's really fascinating to kind of read these books and think about the juxtaposition of the discomfort of just being a human being, right? Having a body to be that we carry around, and then the discomfort of that body being done harm unto. And so I wanted to ask for both of you how you, do, how you decided to do that, why you decided to do that. Because um, I can kind of think about, for example, in, um, in the story Green Afternoon, Vanessa, you write, me and my body began walking, right? And then uh, Demetrius uh, in With the People from the Bridge, these hands are not mine. And that's not the only time. There's kind of an alienation, it seems like. Uh, but the, the in, in With the People from the Bridge, these are not exactly human bodies there. Because you've got, I mean, the um, uh, that particular book uh, uh, handles the the myth, the legend, or myth, however you want, you may want to call it, of the revenant, and therefore, you know, in that particular excerpt, uh, in that particular line, is probably somebody that is being raised from the dead, and does not. I mean, it's 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 a narrative element. It does not. Um, relate to me. It, it's a pure narrative element. Somebody's waking up and he's just feeling so numb that he can't recognize, they, they can't recognize their, their, their hands. She, her, at, at that part, NCTV, who is that, that character. So, I mean, there's a very, you know, um, th th there's a, ve a very precise uh, meaning in in that particular moment of the book, but I don't. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt Vanessa because probably she was about to. No, and uh, spoilers for revelations. Sorry, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Um, no, but but that's not the only place in your books. I think Demetrius, I could be wrong, but the way that I read it was there's an alienation. You mentioned the word numb, and I had that in my notes as well. Um, so I'd love to hear from both of you about how you approach that through language and what the effect is that perhaps you hope for in the reader, even though of course we can't control what our readers do with our books once they're out of our hands. Whoever wants to begin. Um, I think in that uh, particular sentence, particular passage that you reference, in, in that whole story there is a kind of uh, play with disembodiment, I think, because at one point in the story also, spoiler, the um, character feel become separated from their their head become separated from their body I think their head and their emotions um, but not in reality but to them so um, and to be honest I don't know um, I don't know why I did that now now I'm thinking about it I think um, there is always a play between, I think for, for a lot of my stories, 
the character or the human being or the protagonist and their environment, their landscape are one. Like I don't treat them as separate, separate entities necessarily. So whatever um, is within them is projected out and whatever is in the landscape is, is them, is part of them as well. So in a sense, this kind of disembodiment feels a natural way to write if you don't separate the two things in a way. So I suppose I'd explain it more like that, less like there was an intention with this separation, more it's a natural result of the way I write, or at least my implicit kind of, um, my implicit uh, conception of the, the whole story, the story as a whole. Um, but um, yeah, I wish there was more I could add to that because it is a really interesting question and I just don't think I've thought about it directly, I suppose. I guess the more obvious thing to say is the kind of mind-body duality, like I, that's much more obvious, but I think what is more true is this, this sense that, um, I guess this idealistic sense that like the kind of landscape is a reflection of the character's mind. That sounds fascinating. Um, Dimitris? I will ask you a question again. Okay. When you said bodies, yes. did you mean human bodies or bodies in general? I meant bodies in general. Okay. If you mean bodies in general, then I what, what, what that brings to mind is a particular chapter from the new book, chapter S, which is what I call it the slaughterhouse chapter. Now, this is a clinical description of bodies entering a small slaughterhouse alive, coming out in pieces to go to the supermarkets. Um, we read that piece. Uh, actually, that was uh, my previous public appearance, which was uh, a couple of months ago in Italy in uh, Campania Libri Festival. And um, the actually, the actual translator of, uh, of, of uh, the Wasteland of T.S. Eliot in Italy, she read it in Italian and I was there. I mean, the, the reading uh, of that piece uh, took about, uh, lasted uh, around 20 minutes. The interesting thing about it is that uh, somebody went out and fainted. Now, we're probably not used to the way bodies are being handled. We're sitting here, we're going to restaurants, we eat, we have good fun, but these are bodies and we're talking about now of 90 billion bodies being slaughtered every year. So in 20 minutes during the reading of that piece, that must have been something like, according to my calculation, 3 million in 20 minutes. I don't know, I mean, you can make your own calculation. So we're talking about bodies, but we are uh, very much afraid to be confronted with with bodies. And uh, since we are uh, self-centered enough, we think that bodies are only human bodies. So, I mean, when, you, when you're asking me this question, and because, of course, this new book is, uh, is, is a book on violence, this is, you know, this is obvious, and um, we get to the point close to the end, the chapter S is close to the end because we go from, um, the, the book uh, follows the, the classic Latin alphabet and goes from A to Z, so S is close to Z, and uh, uh, the chapter S, not, not, not yet published, uh, in, um, I mean, we, as, as you said, we have different uh, chapters uh, coming up in US, United States magazines mostly, uh, not that one. Uh, so uh, this one is, uh, uh, a, 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 like I said, a very uh, precise and accurate description of what happens uh, in these places and has no orality whatsoever because you started with a question about orality. This is one piece that has no orality to it. I mean, uh, the, uh, an oral style would be engaging, would have um, some 
techniques that um, follow the tradition of uh, orality even in literature. Not so here. You have something which is, uh, it appeals, well, I, I, I suppose it appeals to all senses, but uh, mostly it appeals to vision. And when a text appeals to vision and not to the ear, it is mostly a text that has been written to be read. That one especially because of, like I said, there is, you know, uh, there is enough detail in there to convince you of that. So, bodies. So I think we're going to start the Q&A. We're all going to practice our orality. Um, so who would like to begin? Can we have a big round of applause first, please? Thank you so much for such a fun and dynamic conversation. It was so fascinating to see your minds in action and to hear your different perspectives and to see where that took us. Um, I certainly could not have predicted the trajectory of, of where we would go tonight. So this is absolutely delightful. And I'm so glad we could all share this together. Um, that's my microphone making strange noises. Raise your hand very high and I will bring you the microphone in the room and then we will pivot to our Zoom audience as well if they have questions, but we'll start in person. And someone has to go first, so don't be shy. I dare you to ask about the title. <laughs> I absolutely dare you. <laughs> I have a question about the title. <laughs> be it on your head. Uh, tell me about the title of the works. Tell me about the titles of your works. wants to start? <laughs> what should I say? What do you think you should say? Say again? What do you think you should say? Wh what is the question? Tell, Tell us, us about the titles of your works. I w I'm not I'm not going to do that because w if, if I'm going to go and tell you about the title of my book, say the trilogy or uh, the, the new book, then an I'm imposing an interpretation on you. I mean, why should I do that? And uh, let alone that there are, you know, regarding the trilogy, there are so many reviews out there, you know, uh, regarding the title and uh, there is a, there is a, uh, in, uh, if you go to the Wikipedia entry, there's, um, I think, 11 different explanations, options for that particular title. So why should I pick one? I mean, I could give a, a 12th or a 13th perhaps, but you know, uh, I, I, don't I don't think there is much use in doing that. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's just limiting for the reader. Um, there, there, is, there is no point in, in, in doing that. I mean, uh, the title is there just because you want um, this uh, interface with the reader. It's, it's the first moment in which you are meeting the reader and uh, you shouldn't be imposing ideas on them, I think. So, I, d I mean, I don't know, perhaps Vanessa thinks differently about it, but that's, that's my position. No, actually, well, I would agree with that. That, uh, I mean, yeah, the, I, I could tell you that the title is of Dark Neighborhood. The title of the book is Dark Neighborhood. It's also the title of the first story in the collection. So that's something. Um, but yeah, I think, I suppose we could speak to this um, idea, I guess, of writers explaining their work and explaining um, the words they're using explaining titles and things like that is like something that you're always walking a bit of a fine line with. I did want to ask you, Demetrius, actually about w the last passage that you mentioned and when you said there's no orality in it. Uh, but you mean the you mean the slaughterhouse? The, the slaughterhouse. The, uh, yeah, the S the S chapter of the new book. Yeah. 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 And I mean, do you really mean none in the sense that? If I were writing something, I, w I hear it in my head. Like when I'm writing a something, 
even if I'm not saying it aloud, there is some kind of, I guess, mental sonority to the words. And when somebody reads that passage, they're going to probably not read it aloud, but there's they're going to be sounding it in their head. So there's, when you say none whatsoever, have, have you written it in a way to deliberately interrupt that kind of that no, mental it's, uh, processing? No, um, because it is very detailed, it is a kind of text that could not have been written in the context of what one might call oral literature. This is, this is what I mean. I mean, writing, uh, and not only writing, because writing implies manuscripts, like I said, which is a completely different process, but printing, after the advent of printing, writing changed. And this is why we have the kind of novels that we have. I mean, one could never imagine um, descriptions like those that appear, say, in 19th century novels uh, in, say, an oral context. This is uh, this, this kind of cutting up language and having this visual um, approach to the text in which you can go back and forth you can you know you 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 may be confronted with um, a very complicated text semantically speaking and syntactically speaking but you have the luxury you can allow yourself to go back and check it this is because it is you're making eye contact with the text. You're not making a near contact with the text. And so we have come to the point uh, uh, of uh, creating not only, not only literary texts, also logic, logic, um, mathematical logic, modern logic, whatever you may call it. These, these are outcomes of our writing culture, which is, uh, to my mind, the most important technology that uh, the human animal has invented. Uh, I mean, and, and it's not something that uh, each one of us is forced to use. I mean, we have uh, tribes uh, still in the Amazon that work differently. I mean, we take a lot, a lot for granted. Uh, we, uh, we think that uh, uh, our world is shared by everybody else. It's not true. I mean, um, if I may finish for just one second. I mean, okay, I mentioned now, um, you know, a tribe in the Amazon. For instance, you know, take the Piraha. It's a tribe of uh, 800 people in the Amazon. Their language has no colors. It is it not only that, but their language also, I mean, there, uh, there was a huge debate uh, uh, among linguists uh, regarding uh, what, are, wh what is the deep structure of language, their language has no recursion, which, which according to, to Chomsky is, is an absolutely necessary uh, element for any language to exist. So, but these are oral languages. Now, when I'm talking about uh, a, a written text, what I'm saying is that there is a textual organization which is akin to texts that are very, to texts that are very close to this kind of uh, meticulous description that I, I, I made reference to earlier on. So that, that's, that's what I mean. I don't mean that you're not hearing a voice an ideal voice like Vanessa mentioned, that happens all the time. When you're reading a text, you, you know, there's something that comes in your mind. But there are some elements that make you dis distinguish this kind of orality from something which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's organized differently. Of course there are common elements. We're talking always about language. There are common elements. There is structure. There is structure. There is structure in an oral language as there is structure in a, in a written language. Uh, but nevertheless, there are discrepancies. So, I mean, I, I said that this is a, um, you know, I, I just uh, made a comment on that particular chapter. You know, of course, 
just to give you an idea of what we're, we're talking about here. So, you know. Yes, you, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, Vanessa, I was fascinated with what how you were describing how you structure your stories, how they begin and then they sort of blossom a little bit from the inside that you build where you see things need to get built. And I know it's a difficult thing to talk about because it's so organic and so kind of magic. That's how it happens for me when I'm writing. But I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit. Um, sure. Um, so... I suppose, uh, I don't know, I suppose like a, l a lot of my learning to write and, you know, I'm still, you know, relative to Dimitri, like very early in my writing practice, whatever ever you'd call it. Um, so a lot of my learning to write and understanding how to be a writer is has been about not necessarily about the writing, not necessarily about the quality, like the initial quality of what I put on the page, but more learning about the kind of whole rhythm of writing. So when do I let go? When do I take a break? When do I walk away from the page? When do I go back? All of that stuff has been the stuff that has changed the most, I think. Um, so I suppose to expand on what I said, for example, I would have a mass of things in my mind and often I'll keep the notes on my phone or something like that because often I'll a lot of stuff will come to me when I'm out and I don't have a pen or something like that. And I ended up with this having this bad habit of writing on whatever was nearby. So I just had this like mass of like napkins and um tissues and all this stuff with writing on it and it got really um disorganized so I started putting it all in the notes on my phone eventually I'll transfer all of that into a word document and that's the point where I'm ready to actually start the story that's what what I call the first draft so everything com that comes before that which could be years of just amassing lines of text essentially um, will become uh, these notes which and then I'll start writing the story I tend to start from the first line and I tend to have in mind the last line. And that hasn't differed. If it's a poem, it's kind of the same. If it's a um, novel, uh, that has been the same. I'll have the beginning and the end. And then I'll start writing. And everything else seems to just assemble itself in the process of writing as such. So at that point is the point where... Um, to a certain extent, I relinquish control until the first draft is done. And then that's when I start, I suppose, layering. Um, I go back and do the layering, do the actual, I suppose, like harder work of writing. I, s or I guess what you call writing when we say writing, the decision making that goes into writing that makes something readable and palatable for <laughs> somebody who's reading it. Does that is that uh, does that make sense? Yeah, me too. Yeah. Can we have a final round of applause for our speakers tonight? <laughs>